Good evening and welcome to Scotland at 7 here on Broadcasting Scotland. My name's Kenny McBride. I'm joined this evening by two excellent guests. Firstly, uh, our fairly regular guest here on Broadcasting Scotland, Ronnie Cowan, the MP for Inverclyde. Ronnie, how are you doing this evening? Good morning, Katie. I'm doing very well. Thank you very much. And on the other side of me, uh, a new guest to Broadcasting Scotland, someone I've been looking forward to talking to for a while, uh, and this is drug policy campaigner and a prospective candidate, independent candidate in uh, May's election, Peter Crycant. Peter, how are you doing today? I'm very well, Kenny. Thank you. How are you? I'm not bad at all. So we are going to be talking about uh, the drugs crisis in Scotland and how we how we can tackle that. But first, we have to cover the news headlines for today. And we start, as we always do, with our coronavirus statistics update. And as of 2 p.m. today, a total of 1,481,228 people in Scotland have been tested through NHS Scotland Labs and UK Government Regional Testing Centres since the start of the pandemic. Of these, 1,321,989 were confirmed negative, 159,239 were positive. There were 2,160 new confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Scotland today, and sadly, there were also 61 new reported deaths. This will be an underestimate of the total number of cases, as not everyone with the virus will show symptoms, and not all those will be tested. If you are showing symptoms of a new dry persistent cough, a fever, or a change in your sense of taste or smell, then please do book a test as soon as you can. Of the people who have tested positive, there were 1,860 people in hospital last night, 141 of whom were in intensive care. The number of patients in Scotland who have died from complications caused by the coronavirus infection stands at 5,227. This number only includes those who have died in hospital having received a positive test for the virus. The latest UK daily figures published today show that 87,295 patients who tested positive for COVID-19 have sadly died from their illness, an increase of 1,280 since yesterday. This number refers to deaths in all settings, not just those in hospitals. Following reports that the UK government's business department is planning a race to the bottom on deregulation, including threatening the 48-hour week, rest breaks and holiday pay entitlements, Drew Hendry MP said Westminster cannot be trusted and that independence is the only way to protect and advance workers' rights in Scotland. The SNP's Shadow Business Secretary said that the only way to guarantee workers' rights was to become an independent country with full powers over employment law, equality law and the ability to protect Scotland's place in Europe. The SNP has said the Tory government must deliver a multi-billion pound package of Brexit compensation to Scotland as Scottish fishermen wrote a damning letter to Boris Johnson. The Scottish Fishermen's Federation has today written a devastating letter to the Prime Minister, tearing apart what it called his desperately poor deal. In the letter, SFF Chief Executive Elspeth MacDonald demands details of a compensation scheme as a matter of urgency. And of course, this must be new money and not taken from the £100 million that you have already announced for investment and innovation. She warned that there is a huge disappointment and a great deal of anger about your failure to deliver on promises made repeatedly to this industry. Despite Boris Johnson making a commitment to Parliament's liaison committee that fishing communities would get compensation, Downing Street and Tory Environment Food and Rural Affairs Secretary George Eustace have since appeared to U-turn on this commitment. In Scotland, Rural Economy Secretary Fergus Ewing has called on the UK government to bolster support for Scotland's struggling seafood sector. Following a series of meetings with seafood businesses and organisations this week, the Cabinet Secretary has asked for urgent compensation to be provided to affected businesses, a formal request to be made to the EU for a grace period to sort out and simplify the bureaucracy, and streamlining of the bureaucracy that the UK government has put in place as a result of the deal, with paperwork and IT systems to be urgently looked at. The sector is currently facing a series of challenging impacts due to the establishment of new non-tariff barriers in the Brexit deal. This is compounded by the coronavirus pandemic affecting both national and international trade, with hospitality supplies significantly curtailed at home and abroad. The seafood sector has been particularly hard hit, with companies having little time to put in place new business practices to export to the EU and Northern Ireland, 
and difficulties with understanding new customs and export certification processes. The SNP has called on Douglas Ross and the Tories to apologise to struggling Scottish businesses who have been left in the lurch due to their misleading extra funding claims after the Tory Welsh Secretary today apologised and admitted that it was not new money. Simon Hart said he was sorry if anybody got the impression that it was new money, following Treasury claims that Wales would receive £227 million in additional coronavirus support. The Chancellor pledged earlier this month that he was announcing an additional £4.6 billion for the hardest hit businesses across the UK. A UK government press release then confirmed that the Scottish Government will receive £375 million. This is on top of the increased funding which has already been guaranteed by the UK Government. The move was welcomed by the Scottish Tories, with Douglas Ross tweeting, Very welcome news for Scotland, an extra £375 million to support businesses affected by lockdown measures. The SNP must get this extra funding out the door immediately. However, the Tory government quickly backtracked and amended its own press release to remove any reference to the extra funding, suggesting that Scotland will in fact receive no additional funding. The SNP's Shadow Chancellor has today welcomed the ruling from the Supreme Court that could see thousands of small businesses receive payouts over insurance claims through the UK's Business Interruption Scheme. At the beginning of the pandemic last year, a significant number of businesses were forced to close their doors or reduce their businesses due to government restrictions and as a result made claims on their relevant business interruption policies. Subsequently, many had their claims turned down on the basis that COVID-19 was not deemed by insurers to be a notifiable disease. Others fell foul of their policy wording, which made no provision for closures compelled by local authorities. Today's Supreme Court ruling paves the way for policyholders to have their claims re-examined by insurance companies. More than £55 million in coronavirus support has been paid out to businesses between October and December through Scottish Government funds. Statistics published today show that 13,462 grants totalling £31.4 million have been processed through the Strategic Framework Business Fund between the 2nd of November and the 28th of December. The fund pays up to £3,000 every four weeks to eligible businesses, with one-off top-ups for hospitality, retail and leisure firms also due to be paid this month. Many businesses also continue to benefit from non-domestic rates relief financed by the Scottish Government, in addition to the UK Government furlough scheme. Meanwhile, new management information figures published separately today show that the Scottish Government allocated 383,000 business support awards totalling £2.3 billion between March and the beginning of October of 2020. Federal prosecutors in the US yesterday offered an ominous new assessment of last week's siege of the Capitol by President Donald Trump's supporters, saying in a court filing that rioters intended to capture and assassinate elected officials. Prosecutors offered that view in a filing asking a judge to detain Jacob Chansley, the Arizona man and QAnon conspiracy theorist, who was famously photographed wearing horns as he stood at the desk of Vice President Mike Pence in the chamber of the US Senate. The detention memo written by Justice Department lawyers in Arizona goes into greater detail about the FBI's investigation into Chansley, revealing that he left a note for Pence warning, it's only a matter of time, justice is coming. In Chansley's case, prosecutors said the charges involve active participation in an insurrection attempting to violently overthrow the United States government and warned that the insurrection is still in progress as law enforcement prepares for more demonstrations in Washington and state capitals. Dutch Prime Minister Mark Rutte government has resigned, accepting responsibility for wrongful accusations of fraud by the tax authorities that drove thousands of families to financial ruin, often on the basis of ethnicity. This is about tens of thousands of parents who were crushed under the wheels of the state, Root told journalists. There can be no doubt this is a colossal stain. A parliamentary inquiry found last month that officials at the tax service had wrongly accused families of fraud over childcare subsidies, causing an unprecedented injustice. Around 10,000 families had been forced to repay tens of thousands of euros each, in some cases leading to unemployment, bankruptcies and divorces. 
Many of the families were targeted based on their ethnic origin or dual nationalities, the tax office said last year. An election has already been scheduled for March 17th, at the end of Root's third term. In the case of Abdel Basset al-Megrahi, the Court of Criminal Appeal in Scotland has upheld the verdict of the trial court and rejected both grounds of appeal, and therefore the appeal against conviction has been refused. Ali al-Megrahi, the son of the only man convicted of the Lockerbie bombing, said his family were left heartbroken by the decision of the Scottish courts. He maintains his father's innocence and is determined to fulfil the promise he made to clear his name and that of Libya. The Megrahi family have instructed their solicitor, Amar Anwar, to appeal to the UK Supreme Court. Additional mobile testing units and a rollout of community testing in Fife and Grampian are being introduced to help reduce the spread of coronavirus. These measures are part of a £3 million investment package in Scotland's testing system and will allow NHS Fife and NHS Grampian to introduce community testing from this month. Testing of all care at home providers will begin from the 18th of January to increase, pr increase protection for those providing care and those receiving it. This should ensure Scotland's 85,000 care at home providers have access to testing by the end of January. Locally led community testing will continue to be supported through the National MTU Fleet, which is delivered by the Scottish Ambulance Service. In partnership with the UK Government and through additional funding of £800,000 from the Scottish Government, this fleet will grow from 18 to 42 by March 2021 and will have the capacity to reach 84 communities. And before we get on to speaking to Peter and Ronnie uh, tonight, if you would like to join the conversation here, you can do so on Twitter by following us at Broadcast Scott and using the hashtag Scotland at seven. And also, we do know that a many, great many of you don't watch this show live, uh, but do please tweet at us anyway using that hashtag when you are watching. Uh, it's always very helpful for us to know who's watching, when, and which subjects are catching your attention the most. So do please let us know what you're when you're watching. But now we do come to Ronnie and Peter, and of course, as many people will know, uh, Scotland suffered record drug, de drug deaths in 2019. Uh, that's the most recent figures we have, obviously. Um, and I suppose the first question to ask, uh, and I think, Ronnie, I'll come to you first on this. Um, why is Scotland doing so badly compared to other parts of the UK and to other countries around Europe? What is, what's going on in Scotland, do you think? You know, uh, we, we we come from a society in Scotland as a hard drinking society, and I can only presume, and I'm not an expert on this, but I can only presume we came from that background, and then drugs were allowed into our society and seeped into our society, and there's been that culture for some time. You add on top of that poverty, deprivation, loss of jobs, your life's lived without expectation, and it's a an illness which grows and grows and grows within our society. And we've been at the root of it for, for over 50 years now. And what we're seeing now is a, the accumulation of those numbers uh, coming to the horrendous situation we're, we're currently in. Mm. And Peter, of course, you um, have a history of drug use yourself. Um, thankfully, you're, you're clean now. But um, does what Ronnie's saying there sound like a, an accurate explanation to you? Yeah, I, I suppose that uh, we, we uh, are, are now seeing the impacts of, you know, like I was saying earlier uh, before the show started, of the, you know, the economic dem deprivation that came out of the, the 80s and the 90s, the deindustrialization of Scotland, you know, the lack of job opportunities in, in rural areas, and, um, you know, those, those are, are now resulting in the death that we see today, you know, the, the adverse childhood experiences and the trauma that people went through. Um, a result in, in what we're seeing right now uh, um, in Scotland year upon year, you know, these these uh, outrageous drug death statistics. And, you know, we're talking about more than three times uh, the death rates of the rest of the UK. So, I mean, like you said, there's, there's something specifically going wrong in Scotland in the way that we're treating drug addiction. Mm. And so, obviously, there are... Um... I mean, I come from the generation that can remember Zamo in Grange Hill. That was always why I, I was terrified of heroin uh, as, a, as a young man. Um, what do you think uh, 
is is wrong with the the attitude of kind of criminalizing and just telling people that just say no message why doesn't that work do you think well i mean again we often look back and we think about the war on drugs in terms of you know president nixon standing up and saying we need an all-out offensive uh, war on drugs and then you know nancy reagan and ronald reagan and margaret thatcher you know just say no like you said the grange hill campaign you know and and, and, a, and a, a poster of uh, a young girl many people will remember leah betts who died you know and that was our drug education just so you know and that comes out of you know this prohibition stance that that we've always had um in scotland and throughout the world you know and, and i think we've got to realize that you know drugs are not not an issue for most people that use them you know the the most people who use drugs use them the same as what people who use alcohol you know they they, they use them socially they they don't have all these issues and problems with them and it's a small percentage again the same as alcohol a small percentage of people that use drugs problematically and as long as we continue to criminalize people we're just creating more trauma and we're not giving them a solution to the health issue that they're suffering from Mm. Yeah, and Ronnie, if I can turn back to you now, I mean, we know, as as Peter says, there are a number of, there have been a number of uh, prominent drug users on the front bench of the, the, the government in recent years, um, and they seem to have coped with life fine. Uh, it doesn't seem to have held them back at all. Uh, so why do you think they're so resistant to uh, a more sympathetic approach to problematic drug users? Well, maybe that's part of the problem. Maybe they don't perceive there to be a problem because they've been able to cope with it. So if, if I can manage it, then why can't everybody else? And they see it's a weakness in other people. You know, the, the situation being that the 10% of people who are pretended as problematic drug users are self-medicating against issues in their life which are far greater than their drug intake. You know, what, what has to be the problem? What do you have to be self-medicating for? that you're prepared to inject cocaine into your groin in a rat-infested alley and think that's a better choice. So that's the question we should be asking. What, what, what's causing people to be driven to this level of drug abuse and self-harm that they cannot get away from? They're not going to say, just say no to it. If they could, they would. I've never met anybody who's suffering from addiction, who is in a happy situation, who could just walk away from it. It's much, much deeper than that. So the people in the front benches you talk about, they're recreational drug users. And there are many recreational drug users who live perfectly happy, fulfilling lives. You know, alcohol is accepted in our society. Other drugs have been made illegal, so they got a different reputation. But the fact of the matter is, 90% of people using recreational drugs are not having a problem with it. It's the 10% who are. And the question is not who are there as individuals. The question is what's driven them to that situation that they have to self-medicate to a level which will eventually kill them anyway. Mm. And of course, we've seen uh, in Glasgow, following the, the lessons from Chicago, uh, the, the, the effect of treating violence as a health issue rather than uh, a criminal issue first. Uh, we've also seen from various international research that the same, the same uh, transformative effect can be achieved through treating drug use as a health problem rather than as a criminal justice issue. What do you think is making this current government and you know many of their predecessors so resistant to that uh, difference of, of viewpoint? It's entirely down to attitude. If you look at what happened in Portugal, Portugal was in a, was in a terrible state and they realised they had to do something. And the, at that stage, the law enforcement agencies were not for decriminalising drugs. They thought it was a disaster. But they pushed ahead and they did it anyway, but they were pushed to the brink that they're Drug intake was, was completely out of control, but they did what they had to do and they decrimmed. And the result was to turn it around, turn it into a health issue, and also to free up the police to fight crime. I've, I've spoken to the chief of police in Portugal at the time. He said he totally opposed it, but now he's one of the biggest supporters of it. He's seen what it's done for society, where people can be redirected into health uh, care rather than being criminalised and sent to prison for it. And as a lot for him as a police officer, his police officers are now free to fight crime. But it all comes down to the attitude that says this is a health issue. Currently in the United Kingdom, everything we ask about drug policy is directed through the Home Office. 
Health does not get involved in it at all. Health has to pick up the pieces and say, what can we do to help these people? But in terms of driving them to there in the first place, it's all through the Home Office. I wrote to Boris Johnson on the 19th of December and asked him about drug consumption rooms because he always says they would be condoning drug use. And I spoke to Helen Clark, the ex-Prime Minister of New Zealand, and now head of the World Drug Policy, and I said to her, would you speak to Boris Johnson? And she said, yes, I would, if he picks up the phone. So I wrote to Boris and said, look, drug consumption rooms, I think they're a good thing. I know you don't, but we speak to somebody else, make it non-political, speak to, to Helen White. And he wrote back to me a couple of days ago and said, I've sent your letter onto the Home Office, mm. which completely misses the point. And that's what they're going to do. They see it as a judicial system. We will fight this problem through putting people in prisons. And by the way, it costs more to keep someone in prison than it does to keep them in a rehab bed. But that's what they've been doing. And they've been doing it for 50 years, which has fueled the problem. And right now, rather than, rather than fighting a war on drugs, we should be fighting a war on the cause of addiction. And they just don't get that argument. Mm. Well, let me turn back to you, Peter, because as I said, you, you have a background, uh, you, you use drugs for, for some time. Um, and thank God you've, you've recovered, you're, you're, you know, uh, clean now. Uh, but how, how did you get into that? And then how did you uh, kind of come to, to move out of that and then move into to working in, in treatment and harm reduction? So, yeah, I mean, I, I started uh, taking drugs at a very young age, you know, I was 11 years old when I started uh, taking uh, substances, smoking cannabis, drinking alcohol, and then I went through the range of different drugs to uh, injecting heroin by the age of 17. Um, you know, and I'm really lucky to be alive, you know, I'm alive today through harm reduction, you know, the, the, the people were there when I overdosed and were able to call an ambulance and I got administered naloxone um, to keep me alive and then I got opiate substitute treatments um, and prescribed benzodiazepines which, you know, saved my life for many years. Um, and then I was fortunate enough to to be able to to get into a detox centre, um, you know, detox, and then then my life just moved on from there. But you know, just to sort of pick up on some of that stuff that Ronnie was saying, you know, I think in terms of the UK government, um, you know, and why they're not prepared to change anything at the moment is it's not a vote winner. You know, the UK government stance, and unfortunately, the Scottish government stance up until now has been, you know, we need to get people off drugs. Now, that is not a reality for most people. For most people, a safe supply of prescription medication is the stance that, that, that they, they need to get to, the area that they need to get to, to get off of illicit drugs. Now, that does two things. It stabilises people so we can start creating connections, but it also moves them away from the illicit supply chain and illicit drugs, which are much, obviously much more likely to kill somebody. Mm. And we cannot do that right in Scotland. Now, we could decriminalise drugs tomorrow, but unless we, and that's great for the 90% of people who, who use drugs who never have a problem with them because they don't risk a criminal record. But unless we take that money saved from, de from decriminalisation and sending people to prison and actually put it into the treatment system like Portugal did, we'll never see the results that Portugal got. And that's the narrative that we need to change not just in the UK government, but in the Scottish government, you know, and I, I really hope that the, the that Nicola Sturgeon and the new drug policy minister don't fall into that Tory and also Labour narrative that the best thing to do is get everybody off drugs, because it's that's not going to help uh, greatly. Rehab needs to be available for those that are ready to go, but most are not. There's under 40% of people in any form of treatment in Scotland. That's the key goal. Get people into treatment first, get them stabilised, and then we can offer different solutions. Yeah, um, and I know when you were, I mean, we will talk about what you're you're doing now, but uh, I know before you, you set up the, the van, uh, you, you did go visit some of these other countries where they are doing things a bit differently. Uh, so what did you learn from that? And what kind of, what how did that culture change happen in some of those other countries? Well, I specifically went to uh, Copenhagen, Kenny, because I looked at the, you know, where where uh, safe consumption facilities had started without legal frameworks, um, and it was exactly the same there. They went out, they purchased a van, they they drove it about, they allowed people to come and inject 
inject drugs on it. They didn't have any legal framework, but within a year, they had the framework and they set up their facility. Now, they've got the largest facility in the world in age 17 in Copenhagen. And again, similar to what Ronnie said there, I spoke to the, the police when I was in Copenhagen. I spoke to business owners that were, you know, businesses on either side of the, the consumption facility. And they all say it's the best thing that ever happened. The, the police have been famously quoted to say that they no longer find dead bodies in the street. The businesses, they're absolutely flipped flourish in where the consumption facility is because they've not got lots of discarded equipment and people pu publicly injecting drugs anymore. Um, and what we see from countries around the world that have introduced comprehensive harm reduction in terms of safe supply, getting people off of illicit drugs and onto stabilised drugs, properly proper medication that you would get from for any other health problem, as we see deaths reducing, that's the simple simple fact. Just now, if I go to a doctor or um, a third sector organisation, or eventually get to the NHS drug and alcohol teams who do the prescribing, and and I say to them, I'm taking thirty street benzodiazepines a day. In Scotland, they will simply say. That's that's your problem. We're not going to prescribe a, 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 an alternative for you, and that's absolutely ridiculous. And that's why I was glad that the first minister stood up and said Scotland's got to take responsibility for this because it is a health issue, and health and policing has fully devolved. The powers already lie here to make a difference. Mm -hmm. Now, as we said, you you set up this uh, overdose prevention centre. You call it uh, the, the effectively a, a safe injection site in the back of a van. Um, how how difficult was that to do? And did you have any sort of discussions with politicians or the police or anyone like that before you set it up, or was this just I'm going to do this and see what happens? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty much. I mean, I've had lots of conversations since I set the van up. Ronnie was one of the the, uh, the, the early visitors to come out and see the, the actual overdose prevention van when we were out operating. And um, yeah, yeah, I had lots of conversations with people on the lead up to actually taking it out, you know, drug policy experts, legal experts, you know, to try and find out what the legal sort of environment around this was. Um, and, you know, and what we quickly came to understand is that we really operate in a legal uh, grey area. Um, and, and ultimately, you know, the, the police have not intervened, they've not tried to close us down because the, the Misuse of Drugs Act is so outdated. You have to years old. Uh, it actually talks about a premises being uh, allowed to be used for opium to be smoked. You know, like we're living in some Victorian age. That's how outdated the Misuse of Drugs Act. And of course, we could do a lot quickly in Scotland if that was devolved or, you know, we had independence and we could make those decisions for ourselves. But like I'll go back to again and again, unless we put the money and invest the money into helping those 10 percent of problematic users, nothing's going to change. Now, um, famously, you know, when needle exchange sites were, were first set up, <clears throat> users would find that they would go in, get their clean needles and then on the way out, the police would be wait, watching and waiting for them and they would get lifted. Has anything like that happened with users uh, using your, your van? Um, the police have, have monitored the service on a few occasions and there was one sort of uh, alleged incident where you know there was a, an alleged obstruction when there was three homeless people in the van. Um, so there's been some monitoring, but it's not it's not like that draconian sort of 1980s where people would actually, uh, people, sorry, the police would actually sit outside the needle exchanges, undercover police, and, and, and arrest people going in or coming out of the needle exchanges. I mean, I remember those dark days um, of needle exchanges when I first started using drugs and injecting drugs. Um, you could only get three clean needles if you took the old needles back you know we've come so far in terms of that side but we've still got a long way to go i mean 
we, we, we ask why people publicly inject drugs. If somebody's homeless and you give them inject, injecting equipment, they're going to use it publicly. Um, so, you know, there's not been that, that, that draconian method of policing. And I think Police Scotland have actually took a really considered approach to it um, in terms of what we're doing. Because, again, it's, it's difficult for anybody to see the legality, the, the illegal aspect of the, the safe, safe injection facility. Now, having said all that, you yourself did get arrested towards the end of last year. What happened there? What went uh, What went wrong there? Um, well, actually, it was uh, I wasn't arrested. I was charged. Um, you know, the, the 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 newspaper preview. One one of the national newspapers reported on the front of the the newspaper that I was uh, arrested, and they had to re issue a retractment. Of I do apologise then. Exactly. Sorry about that. Yeah, it was uh, uh, just so that we were clear. It was a, it was a, there's two. Uh, there's a difference in Scotland mm -hmm. um, be, between being charged and arrest, arrested. Um, so I was charged, and that was under uh, an alleged alleged obstruction. Again, that sort of uh, ties into before. You know, the, the police have had quite a measured response to this, um, but I think. On that occasion, for one reason or another, they chose to try and, and, and have some sort of intervention. But you know, they, they cannot find the illegal aspect of the actual providing of the premises. You know, uh, so the only illegal aspect we're looking at is the you know the the homeless people or the people who are are, are using the service in possession of the drugs. Um, and that's always been our call. You know, ultimately, the Scottish government can't change the law, and they cannot direct the Lord Advocate to to step in because it's he's the senior law officer. It has to be his decision. But I think it's quite clear now that the, the senior law officer, the Lord Advocate, appointed by the Scottish government, could step in and provide a non-prosecution stance for those attending the service. And then, if he is not willing to do that, like I said to Nicola Sturgeon. Um, just over a week ago when I met her, that if the Lord Advocate's not willing to do it, please ask the Lord Advocate to step aside and appoint a new Lord Advocate, because we need somebody now who's going to stand up and be counted as more than three of our citizens die on a daily basis, to push the, the boundaries of devolution until such a time as we have these powers sitting within the Scottish Parliament that we can make these decisions ourselves following a, 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 a referendum. Mm. And just speaking of the, the, the what you do with the van, obviously you mentioned a lot of uh, the, the addicts that you're dealing with are people who have other major problems in their lives. Many are homeless, for example. Are you doing any work to try and help them kind of sort out some of those other problems or are you just focused on uh, helping them manage their drug use? Yeah. Unfortunately, Kenny, you know, it's a very low-tech service. You know, we, we're not funded. It's all privately funded through private donations. You know, we're, we're simply there to keep people alive. You know, if somebody had an overdose, we can intervene and we can save their life because that's really simple to do. That's been demonstrated around the world. You know, there's over 150 of these sites. There's millions of visits happening to these sites and there's never been a single recorded fatality in any of them. What we would love to see is an official facility where we have add-on services where we can provide health and welfare, um, social psychological support, and most importantly, uh, we can provide safe alternative medication to people. Um, mm. and, and that's the most frustrating part about the service that I run. I can direct anybody who's coming along to inject heroin and taking handfuls of these street Valium. I cannot direct them anywhere to get a safe alternative. Um, the NHS provide all the prescribing in Scotland, and they're so risk averse. And 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 I, and I don't and I, and that's why Scotland. This is Scotland's problem because if I'm a heroin addict and and Birmingham as an example, I change go live and I say I'm a heroin addict and I want some help they'll assess me and give me a prescription. If I go to Change Grow Live here in Edinburgh, they'll assess me and then they have to send me to the NHS prescribers. That's a whole other appointment. And when I get there, the NHS are so risk averse, it takes double the amount of time to get to that optimal level dose that in Scotland is what it does down in England. Mm. Well, let me turn back to Ronnie now. And Ronnie, um, the, the politics of this, obviously, we've, we've talked about a wee bit. Uh, but there has been a bit of a change in 
in mentality in Scotland and as, as Peter said, a wee bit of a, a shift in the Scottish government as well. What do you think has driven that change in Scotland's approach in recent years? Well, the, the actual change of approach is fairly recent and it could just be born out of sheer frustration. Uh, we've been looking, this, this is the point of the Lord Advocate is very important. If the Lord Advocate interpreted that piece of law differently, then we would have DCRs open running in Scotland right now. But it's not the position of a government to tell the Lord Advocate what he has to do. Politicians do not tell the judiciary what they have to do. That's very important to, to, to our, our democracy, that we don't, as politicians, or governments don't have the power to simply overrule the laws of the land and tell uh, the Lord Advocate how he must rule. We can advise, we can explain, we can put our case forward, we can put our own legal representation, but ultimately it has to be his decision. If we start telling Lord Advocate what he can rule on and how he can rule on it, it's a very dangerous path to go down. Mm. So we've been in that situation a bit of a long time for some time. We've recognised it. And I think I can, I can blame COVID and stuff like that, say things got ahead of us. But whatever's happened is we've got to the point where we've now said to lance that boil. And we're now saying we've got to push this forward, take full responsibility for it in Scotland and do whatever we can. But ultimately, that piece of law has either got to be reinterpreted by the Lord Advocate. As Peter said, it talks about smoking opium and stuff like that. It's a horrendous piece of legislation in 1971, 50 years down the road. It just doesn't bear any resemblance to the world we're living in. So you'd hope the Lord Advocate would take that on board. But we can't tell him to. But I would see it again and say, I hope he does. Mm. But beyond that, there's, there's, there's holes in our system, which Peter actually pointed out there in terms of prescribing and, and in terms of we can look at the, the rehabilitation beds, the provision and the funding of those. All that has to be addressed in Scotland. And I now believe there's an appetite for us to go ahead and do that. Um, uh, First Minister is making a statement next week on this. Uh, she wouldn't be able to turn around and say we're solving all these problems overnight. But as, as, as I've said often before, people quite rightly criticise politicians by saying, you know, you keep on talking and we keep on dying. So hopefully we've got to a point now where action will be planned and we can see when it's going to happen and we can start putting some better practices in place. Now, there are um, things that the, the Scottish government can control. It does control policing and it, in theory, we could uh, do what was done, what has been done in places with uh, prostitution, for example, where there is a kind of de facto uh, decriminalisation. Um, there's also uh, full control over health. So some of these kinds of prescription issues could be could be changed. Uh, is there an appetite now in the the Scottish government, do you think, to, to really push at those limits of devolution and see how far policy can be changed within devolved issues to maybe circumvent some of the, the laws that are, are set at Westminster? Well, if there's not, there should be. <laughs> I'm pretty confident there is. You know, we want as many powers as we can get in Scotland. It's what, it's what we're about. Circumventing laws is a tricky thing. The situation we've put Police Scotland in is that we're trying to tell them to, inter to again to interpret the law. Do you arrest people for personal possession? And in some places in Scotland, they are. And the, the danger in doing that is you arrest somebody for personal possession, uh, they get fined, they're then going to pay that fine. So they go back to their dealer, their dealer says, here's some extra stuff, you sell that on to family and friends, and that'll be enough money to pay off your fine. The, most people are introduced to drugs by family and friends, not by dealers and pushers. So mm. by, by arresting people for personal possession, we're actually perpetuating the problem because people need money to pay the fine and they've had their, they've had their gear taken off them. And we are still doing that in Scotland. We are still arresting people for personal possession. And what we do is we turn these people into mini dealers to pay off their fines. But I mean, I, that, that's the situation the police force find themselves in. Again, it's not up to the police to say, we'll enforce that law, but not that one. We put them in a difficult situation and the blame lies fairly and squarely at the people who legislate and make the laws. And that is including myself is the politicians. Mm. Now, we, we talked a little bit about how uh, taking, a, taking a more kind of compassionate stance on drugs hasn't necessarily been a vote winner in the past. I wonder, um, is this something that you think could be a vote winner now? Do you think that the public support for doing something different now is 
starting to get to where uh, a more compassionate approach, a more kind of evidence-led approach, is actually something that the public support now? I would like to think so. It's going to be very hard to judge because people vote on many different issues. Certainly, I found in I had a campaign just over a year, well, just over a year ago now, 2019 was the last time I stood for election, and we spoke about the subject very openly and very honestly. And uh, amongst all the candidates, there was no real pushback that people were seeing it as a health issue. What we should do was, was part of the problem. Uh, and yes, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not going to be overly political about it. There were some different views from the, the Conservative candidate who stood against me, but by and large, people were saying, we, we, we understand that, what can we do? So, you know, if all parties take that stance, then it depoliticizes it. It's not an issue for parties to stand up and say, this is what we've got to do. But I think in, in general, certainly from talking to, to the, the general public and the electorate in the five and a bit years I've been elected, it's become a much easier conversation and people are much more tuned into it and much more knowledgeable about it. And more and more, they're, they're seeing it as a situation where we're getting to a breaking point and they're understanding that we've been pushing this narrative of it's a crime for all these years and they've seen the situation getting worse. So they're open to the idea now that we have to do something and position it as a health issue. But there are still, there's still that cohort of people whose views is uh, like, like all addictions, they're, they're self-imposed, you know, you inject yourself, you lift that drink, you're the, you're the gambler, you're doing it to yourself, and these people just simply don't understand addiction. But that number is, 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 is certainly shrinking. Mm. And speaking of public support, Peter, just to come back to you now, um, you said, as you, uh, the, the van is funded entirely from private donations from just ordinary people. Uh, what kind of support have you had from people that you talk to, just ordinary people uh, who are donating, people who are uh, promoting what you do? Yeah, it's, it's absolutely uh, been fantastic, Ken. You know, I, I, first time I drove my, my, my uh, supervised injection van into Glasgow, I didn't know what to expect. You know, I'm driving into park next to people's houses and, and, and businesses. I'm thinking, are people going to come out with pitch, pitchforks and, and chase me away? Um, but the simple reality is that the, the, the massive uh, majority of people see the need for a service like this in Glasgow City Centre now. You know, they, they see that giving people needles uh, who don't have anywhere to go and use them is not going to solve the issue. It's not, not going to encourage people to, to get off drugs onto medications where they can stabilise and, and stop taking illicit drugs. You know, so I think we, we are seeing great support, you know, lots of donations support internationally. Helen Clark, uh, who uh, Ronnie previously mentioned, the former Prime Minister of New Zealand and current chair of the, the Global Commission on Drugs Policy, has been an amazing supporter. I think she will actually be speaking with the First Minister soon as well. I think they are arranging to speak. Um, and that's why I've decided to take my campaign forward and, and for election as a, an MSP in the, the, the parliamentary election on the 6th of May. Um, because I, I see the, the overall need for uh, policy reform just now to, to save people is, is what we need in terms of uh, new prescribing procedures. But the bigger picture is we need investment in our local communities and businesses to support growth, to support employment, to give people enough money to feed their kids. I mean, we've got people working in Scotland, parents, working parents, both working 40 hours a week, having to claim benefits on top just so that they can actually feed their kids. You know, and it's absolutely ridiculous. Our, our local communities and council areas are, are really suffering, and that's where we need to tackle the root causes of this, the trauma, the adverse childhood experiences, so people don't use those drugs problematically later on in life. And, um, you know, your, your van has been in Glasgow, uh, but Glasgow is not the only place where people use drugs. I mean, Dundee has had serious problems. There's problems in rural parts of Scotland. There's, I mean, there's, there's problems everywhere. Uh, has anyone else been talking to you about potentially setting up something similar in any other parts of Scotland? Well, I think anywhere that there's public injecting, Jenny, we, we could we could use one of these facilities. It's a health facility. 
um, and it supports people to to get into treatment. Uh, Dundee would be the specific. Uh, if we get this sort of de facto decriminalisation around street level drug use, which is actually already in place, by the way, in, in West Midlands, so we can the, the the senior law officer in Scotland can maybe have a chat with the police and crime commissioner in West Midlands to talk about how this can be done here. Um, but we could see one in Dundee. I mean, we 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 see massive increases. I mean, in Falkirk, where I'm from, uh, where I'm born and raised, where I'm running for election to represent the views of my community. In 2009, we had five drug-related deaths in 2009. In 2019, we had 41. Um, so this is an issue that's affecting all of Scotland. You know, only a couple of days ago was the anniversary of my cousin's uh, funeral um you know and, and i've had family friends uh dying in their numbers over the last few years and um, they wouldn't be dying in england that's that's the that's the really um you know, the really sad bit that, that we're so far behind the rest of the uk and how we're, how we're dealing with that and um i heard you uh in an interview this was a wee while ago now but you said that the scottish government seemed to see safe consumption sites as a kind of silver bullet um, and that they, they weren't looking at maybe the, some of the other issues that need to be dealt with. Uh, is that something that you think has changed, particularly uh, since Angela Constance was appointed to, to deal with drugs directly? And what are some of those other things that you need to be that you think need to be addressed? Yeah, I think I, I'm not sure if I said that. I think the Scottish government see it as a silver bullet, but I think it was it was it was definitely a political football for a period of time. You know, between Westminster and you know the Scottish government, and you know I watched the the, the public mem the sorry the private members debate live yesterday when um, the MSPs had a minute's silence at the beginning. Um, you know, and people thank Joe Fitzpatrick, and I thank Joe Fitzpatrick, you know, but he had such a difficult job. Let's not forget that the Scottish Government cut the budget for alcohol and drug partnerships in 2016, and Joe Fitzpatrick came into post in the middle of 2018, when we were already three years into the UK's biggest HIV outbreak in 30 years, and we were halfway through the worst death rate recorded. Uh, when he came into post. Unfortunately, he made some bad decisions in terms of playing a political football with this, because there's no magic wand that's going to solve this. It needs a, a concerted uh, approach from all the services out there. The frontline services need to be given the proper funding in order to support people into treatment. But what I would hate to see and is that the, the Scottish Government uh, and the SNP Scottish Government go down the vote winner line about getting everybody off drugs. You know, if Nicola Sturgeon comes out and says, yes, we're putting 15 or 20 million pounds into residential rehabilitation centres and we're going to get everybody off drugs and, that, and it's all going to be fine, I would, I would hate to see that because that's just feeding into the narrative that's been going for the last 40 or 50 years that drugs are bad and everybody needs to get off drugs. Actually, taking somebody off drugs altogether can be one of the most dangerous things that you do for them if you don't have the proper psychological social, social care around them when they come out of these residential rehabilitation centres. Yeah. And uh, now, obviously, whether or not you do get elected in May, I'm sure you're going to keep campaigning on this. But what are the, the things that you hope that you can achieve uh, in the, the sort of immediate future? But the immediate future is, uh, is, I suppose it's a bit of a, a TV exclusive here. Um, Kenny, we, I have just purchased a, an ambulance, an ex-ambulance. Um, so we're, we're really sort of now pushing the pushing it forward in terms of this being a, a real health issue. You know, I think, um, you know, it's quite symbolic. You know, it's, it's a health authority ambulance. It's been used for 10 years to go out and save people's lives. And it's going to be able to continue in that capacity. Um, in the immediate future, I would like to see uh, the, the framework set up to establish one of these facilities in Glasgow before we get into the real campaign for the Scottish elections. Because when that happens, it's going to be focused on winning votes. Um, you know, and and also I would like to see um, safe supply made the biggest priority. Under forty percent of, I mean, we've seen this this report the other day that in Perth, there's less than. 30
30% of people who use drugs problematically in any form of treatment. Now, we're talking, there's been a lot of talk about funding rehab, and I believe rehabs need to be funded, but the primary goal right now is to get more people into treatment. 40% in Scotland, and compared to over 60% in England and Wales. If we don't get more people into treatment, nothing's going to change with these death rates. We need to give the non-medical prescribers the opportunity to give people a safe supply of medication. That's all we're looking for. Mm. Well, let me turn to you now, Ronnie. I know you have raised this issue several times in your time at Westminster. Uh, what are you looking at doing uh, to try and change mentalities at Westminster? And what uh, what hope do you think you have of getting anything done down there? It's, it's the job of politicians to just stick at it. You repeat it, and you repeat it, and you repeat it, and you just never know where you're going to hear a friendly voice. I, I actually thought when Boris Johnson took over as Prime Minister, we might get a friend or, uh, or better hearing from him. Uh, and people like, like Michael Gove and stuff like that, who, who would, I believe have admitted uh, the drug use. So you'd think they'd be more switched on to it and have a better understanding of it, but it hasn't happened that way. The, the, the Conservative and the Union's government are sitting there with a majority of 80. They can basically vote through anything they want to vote through. So all I can really do is what I've done for the last five years and just chip away and try and find friendly voices. And there are friendly voices within the Conservative Party. There are friendly voices in, in all parties, but we have to find an issue which we can push forward and make a win on. And then by having a campaign like that, whether it be something like medical cannabis, then people realise that we can actually combine and make things happen, make good things happen for our community. So it could be from getting something like that, and then move on to the next project, the next campaign, the next issue. And politics is all about the repetition, I'm afraid. Uh, so down at Westminster, changing attitude is what it's all about. But if you, you tend to do that one person at a time, rather than a key change, but if that one person you know is on your side and is a more sympathetic ear, finds themselves in an elevated position, finds themselves in a ministerial position, then things can happen and, and they can happen very, very quickly. So all the time we're looking to build relationships, we're looking to build a, a relationship where people can understand what we're trying to put forward, hear their points of views. And it's almost like a sifting process until you find the ones that you believe are actually on board and have the courage to take it forward. And then if fate plays a good hand, they find themselves in a position and then the key is, do these people stand by what they said before they became ministers or does all that suddenly fall to the side? Mm. And in the past we've seen both things happen, but we've made, I've been involved in gambling related harm and we've made some pretty uh, fundamental changes in gambling related harm because we had a change of ministers, because we had people in positions and we're looking at a gambling act. And I think the new gambling act, although it wouldn't be everything I'm looking for, or well, some fundamental changes in there, particularly about provision for health care for people who've developed a gambling addiction. So it's not beyond the realms of possibility that we can do the same thing with drugs. But with this current government sitting there with a, a majority of 80, it's going to be, as they say, a, a, a long, hard fight. Yeah? Mm. So uh, not necessarily the, the best prospects of success at Westminster, uh, Peter. How hopeful are you now uh, from having met with uh, the First Minister and, and Angela Constance recently. How hopeful are you that even if you don't get elected, that the, the current Scottish Government will still really pursue this aggressively? Yeah, I, I would agree with, with Ronnie. I think it's, 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 it must be a difficult challenge uh, going down to the Westminster and constantly. I mean, I've watched uh, countless times as, as Ronnie and uh, Alison Fearless and Joanna Cherry, Tommy Shepherd, you know, have, have raised these questions time and time again for the year, you know, that we need a different approach. I must feel like banging your head against a brick wall. Um, but what, what I do have confidence in for the first time is that the Scottish Government are actually going to, going to follow the evidence. Um, you know, the, the Scottish Government many years ago, I think, fell in, into the mistake of, you know, the vote winner, you know, and, 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 and the vote winner has always been uh, uh, combined with the narrative of the war on drugs, that, that drugs are bad, that the best thing is to get people off drugs um, and, and send everybody uh, to, to, you know, big houses and, and fields somewhere, um, levitating while they're meditating and clapping horses. You know, that's that's just not realistic. You know, it's not realistic. We need to get people onto 
onto prescriptions and off of illicit drugs. And that's how you cut the supply chain. And it's actually how you save money because people then don't end up in hospital um, through these really illicit cut drugs that nobody knows what, what's in them. So I am hopeful, but we'll wait and see what Nicola Sturgeon has got to say uh, in the Scottish Parliament at the end of this month. But Angela Constance del delivers uh, a really confident, uh, really confident, and you know, again, in the Scottish Parliament debate yesterday, she she delivered a, a, an excellent speech at the end. Um, and if she follows it through with the actions that that, that we've already discussed privately, myself and Angela, um, I believe that we can have an impact and we can reduce these deaths this year. I mean, 2020 is already gone, and we know it didn't get any better in 2020. The Scottish Drug Death Task Force was set up 18 months ago. It's had no impact on the drug deaths so far, and that's 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 simple actions that that have not been taken. Um, I, I hope and I pray for the sake of all the the mothers and the, the the fathers and the brothers and sisters that have contacted me over the last year losing a loved one that we don't see the same again in 2021. Well, Peter, um, unfortunately, we are just about out of time. Um, it's been a real uh, pleasure talking to you. Um, if people do want to support what you're doing, uh, how can they contribute? Uh, well, the, 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 the easiest way uh, to find my uh, campaign is through our website. So it's uh, safeconsumptionglasgow.com uh, and you can find uh, the website, which will lead you to my Twitter page um, and Instagram pages and stuff as well. So, you know, it's, it's very much now financially, we're, we're in an okay position. It's really about the public support and gaining public support for safer supply and safer consumption. Absolutely. Well, thank you to Peter Crackant and to Ronnie Cowan for joining us. Uh, as I say, there is a lot more we could talk about, but we only have a certain amount of time here on Scotland at Seven. So hopefully we will hear from both of you again sometime soon. Uh, but thank you at home for joining us as well. There would be no point in us making these shows if you weren't with us. So thank you very much for spending an hour with us. Um, if you're able to support Broadcasting Scotland, we would ask that you go to broadcastingscotland.scot slash register, sign up there as a supporter, and your £5 a month is what helps us keep doing what we do here. Uh, we are, of course, also running a crowdfunder just now. We're trying by April to raise enough money to employ a full-time editor and some full-time journalists. So if you'd like to make a one-off donation to that, you can go to broadcastingscotland.scot slash donate. If you're not able to support us financially, we do understand and the shows will always be free to view online, but you can still do us a really good turn by following us on Twitter at Broadcast Scott, by liking our Facebook page, subscribing to our YouTube channel, uh, by finding us on the Amazon Fire Stick and uh, I think making that a favourite as well. Uh, and then sharing these shows with your friends and family. I think tonight's show especially is a, a great one to share if people are interested in this topic. Um, and let, that's the best way for us to spread the word about what we do here at Broadcasting Scotland. So do please help us out that way. And finally, we've mentioned employing staff, but we also want to uh, recruit some volunteers as well. There's a lot more we could do if we just had people willing to donate a few hours uh, to help us out here with all the, the work that goes into producing these shows. So if you're interested in that, if you have some skills that you want to polish up or if you want to learn some new skills in broadcasting, whether it's in front of or behind the camera, please do get in touch with us. Uh, you can find all the contact details on the website. But that is absolutely all we have time for tonight. So thanks once again to Peter Crackant and to Ronnie Cowan. Uh, I will be back again on Sunday with the Fool Scottish at noon and then Gordon will be back with Scotland at 7 on Monday. But until then, thanks very much for joining us and have a great night. Good night. The Catalans, the Basques, the Galicians in the, the Basque. An independent future for Scotland. How quickly do you think a, a referendum can be arranged?
best practice commands for the tape that should be six months. Just looking at the, the overall share uh, numbers for Scotland at the moment, the SNP 46.4%.